and take it over. Hi, everybody. Um, it's great to see everybody here. Uh, I don't know how many people don't know me. Apparently, everyone knows me, but I'll introduce myself anyways. So um, I studied molecular biology at MIT, and I spent a little bit of time back in 2008, 2009 with um, Eric Praxlis and the crew at Janssen. And I don't know if there's people from Janssen today, but we worked on a little prototype to do um, what eventually became Transmart. And it was kind of interesting because I'm originally not from the life sciences world. I mean, I kind of grew up in a place where we were doing a lot of um, software development and a lot of work doing um, analytics of health records, but we were always doing it from the provider side. And then when I popped in into the life sciences world, um, I made all sorts of assumptions of how people want to do things in uh, a pharmaceutical company. And maybe over the course of seven years, I've learned one or two things, probably not that much. Um, but among the things that's made a big change for me to get a, a bit of perspective since we started up doing the Transmart project is inside of Deloitte, it's a big consulting company. And we end up talking about a lot of topics up at the C-suite or, or in, in groups in the top levels of IT that are a little broader than just Transmart. And one of the areas that I've been working towards and keep trying to figure out, and if people have a better answer than me, that's great, is where does Transmart fit into the picture for a life sciences company? And, and in order to get there, I, I, I wanted to get into what are life sciences companies really trying to do with data? Um, so that's what I'm going to try and talk about today. Um, who is this even going forward? And maybe the first inkling that there was more going on than just Transmart in a life sciences company for me was when I started off working at Janssen, we started gathering lots of data on Remicade. It was everything we could find to bring together the different data sets from existing clinical trials, pre-clinical data sets. And I'm coming in as this guy from the healthcare background. It's like, where's the EMR data? And they're like, oh, we have the EMR data. It's over here. You can't touch it which was like a data set they bought from GE. I said, where's the claims data? They go, oh, we have the claims data too. We buy all this market scan data. It's also over here. You can't touch it. It has nothing to do with what you're trying to do. You're trying to find biomarkers. That stuff's different. Um, but it bothered me um, because I wanted to get all that information into a place where we could make use of the kind of work we had done before because the kind of work we had done before coming to uh, work on the original Transmart project was working with I2B2. And it was only built to work with EMR data. And we were going to take it, because we were asked to, um, and adapt it to this clinical trial use case. And so I'll, I'll, I'll briefly say what I've learned over time is that life sciences companies are all about evidence. It's, it's all about taking a product which starts off as a potential compound or a potential large molecule and bring it through this long cycle, which never really ends, even once a drug is off patent, to generate evidence to make sure that it succeeds in the market. And if it's something that is not going to succeed in the market, it's to get it out of the pipeline so that something else can. And so the basic progress within a life sciences company just begins with basic bench science and, and, and research, where they're taking things, maybe they're licensed or their they're work that's gone on to do identification, through preclinical, where they're working with our humans. I know everyone knows this. Phase one through three, post-marketing. The question is, where does evidence come into this picture? Well, this is what you want for evidence from each of these groups. And so this is the kind of content that you're trying to generate from all this data. So if we're, we're trying to aggregate data, the purpose is to support some of these functional groups inside of the organization to generate information to support the outcome. The most valuable outcomes from a financial standpoint are actually the ones down on the right. So if I have a product, you know, there's, there's two or three pharmaceutical companies we're working with who are just going through launch, and I'm trying to take that product out to market, I want to find every organization, company that can acquire that product and reimburse for it. But in order to get reimbursement for this drug, I need to have proof beyond just the FDA's clearance that it's safe and effective. And so you end up producing value dossiers, prevent, present information to physicians that show that this is a drug that should be used in a first line instead of a second line drug. All that content is really important 
in order to get the drug out to market. And it's all global, and that information is getting bigger and bigger from each of the groups that's trying to collect it. But if we go all the way back, you have groups just trying to figure out what targets should we go after. You know, it's the big information on a, a molecular target of interest, or it's what products do we have we're trying to um, look at developing, and are there actually patients who are in a population big enough to treat so we can invest the $100 million it's going to take to bring something to market. Now, Transmart has a bit of a role in all these places. I'd say the place where it ends up having the biggest use, most likely, is in understanding disease progression treatment patterns and protocol design. I'm not saying it can't help with all these other things, but the reason why those guys at Janssen told me stay away from that EHR data and stay away from the other data, at least at the time, was the people who looked at that data are down in the lower right, and they're in the upper left. They were looking at trying to understand what does my business look like, how many patients work. Now, that's starting to collapse a bit. It doesn't mean Transmart's going to cover all those things, but I think we have to be realistic that there's a massive body of work in all those groups. There are people in safety and surveillance who use very mature systems to analyze their EMR data, and they might want to get EMR data out of a tool like Transmart, but they're probably not going to go there as the primary source. And so we're likely to be a good landing zone for some of the information that needs to be prepped to support some of these other groups. But the actual analytics is most likely going to stay exactly where it lives inside each of those groups in their home. Now, evidence used to be fairly simple. You'd run a clinical trial. That would be called like your uh, non-real-world evidence. But now there's this new thing called real-world evidence. And I don't know how many people here even think about it because we're on the translational research side. But it's this bizarre concept that everything before we study things in a real physician's office isn't real-world evidence. And there's a reason for it. It's, it's basically information in a clinical trial is controlled data. We've controlled the experiment. We took patients who had no other medications, no other diseases. We picked them out. We followed a protocol. We did every single step the same. That's not wild-type data. That's not what really is going to happen. So real-world evidence on the other side is looking at all the things that occur in the physician's office, and it's getting even messier because we're starting to get in things like sensor data, which I'm sure Julie's working on a project to bring into the mix, that you know, the patient themselves is out there. We're starting to work with engagements with patients directly from a life sciences company. And so the, the old way in which you would engage a patient would be through a, a hub vendor. So you would have patient support going through a third party so the patients would come and call the third party, and they'd answer a couple of questions about your med. But nowadays, we're getting to these specialized medications that were talked about a little bit earlier. And the hub vendor is not really equipped to answer questions for a population of 5,000 patients. And so that's getting condensed and becoming a direct function of the life sciences company. They're building their own CRM systems, their own ways to directly engage and ask questions. And so information is going to be flowing right back in from the CRM system of a life sciences company that goes around all these other routes about exactly what's going on with their patients. And it's another way in which they can get to some of that translational research that we'd be looking at. And I'd say there's also this need to bring in all the external information. Right? It's not just about patient-level data in order to generate evidence. A lot of the evidence that groups are looking at are condensing the content from the outside world. Um, and you got also even up there maybe one more box that's a new box to worry about is social. Um, we're seeing, and I think everybody's also seeing, that there's a number of disease advocacy groups. So you have groups like patients like me, they're coming in and generating these new data sets that are um, interesting about you know, ALS, because the whole community of ALS people are, are, are feeding in their information. That's definitely not going to fall into that category of a controlled clinical trial. <laughs> That's free form text, anyone wanting to say anything about your drug, and it may go all the way out to Twitter. And we can get to why Twitter is sort of like genomics later. So, you know, on our side, just quickly mention, we're still trying to figure out and we're still supporting Transmart. We have new deployments of Transmart. I can talk about uh, one of them a little bit later at CCFA, which is part of a solution to support Crohn's and colitis. It's very exciting for me because we started working on Remicade, and Remicade is, among many things, an IBD drug. Um, and so we're still working with the foundation. We're a 
uh, I guess it's a gold level sponsor. We're on the board of directors. And, and my goal and, and our group's goal is to fit Transmart into this big picture we're trying to support for this end-to-end -end life, life cycle for evidence within the pharma companies. But it really does fit mostly spreading out from there's use cases that cluster around because we're trying to bring in a lot of phenotype and genotype information. And I think that's where its sweet spot is, is bringing together phenotype, genotype information, legacy clinical trials, third-party trials or studies that can be combined with it, and bring them into a common format that can be used either in a toolkit or just used as the data in a form that's usable. I'll get into where I think the context of putting this together really is in a bit, but the the punchline maybe for Transmart from my perspective is its greatest values to the life sciences organizations are A, it allows external information to come in which otherwise wouldn't come in. Meaning there are groups who are outside parties like Michael J. Fox who could create a structure of their information, make it consumable that could be brought in in a state that's not going to cause the company to re-index, reformat, restructure, and get that burden of cost over and overall into the content, which means its value in many ways is in a data structure and a interoperability format, not necessarily the analytics. I'm not saying the analytics are not important, but, but first and foremost, you know, the, the big struggle is how do I get my data ready so we can use it in this downstream format? And I think it's similar inside of the life sciences company. How do I get that information into that format so I can use it for all my legacy clinical trials, legacy studies, because the the reality is the historical function of those studies is that they were not produced in SDTM. They were not coded to Medra. This is getting better, luckily. So, you know, we were working with one of the life sciences companies recently, and um, they're like, okay, everything's already in SDTM that we want to convert. You don't have to worry about that piece. We have a data format. But what we need you to do now is make it possible to select samples based on all the information in our SDTM if we have a sample and we need you to do just enough curation, not tons of curation to get into format so we can put a front end that's in a tool like Transmart or ClickView or some piece of technology that can let us sort out and find those things. Because if we can do that, we can solve our business problem. We know we can get samples, we know we can genotype people, we can go look for biomarkers. So I'll talk really quickly about like openness is important. <laughs> for what we're trying to do. And I, I could get into a lot of the boxes of this slide. I'm just going to focus on open source and open standards. Um, and I think, I'm trying to remember who it was who first said it. It was, it was, it was I think, John Wilbanks, who's the guy who's the originator of uh, Creative Commons. And he basically likened open standards and, and open source to open land. And I happen to live right next to a park. <laughs> and there's a reason why I chose to live next to a park. It's because I don't want to build a basketball court, I don't want to build tennis courts, and I don't like having my kids run around on my lawn. And you can't just expect open spaces to exist in the world. They must be created and invested in by the community, but when they do, everybody can participate in that open space. And the alternative, if there wasn't a park next to my house, would be a whole lot more houses, but we'd have nowhere to play. <laughs> and so, when we look at working with a lot of the groups that are trying to get into this evidence generation project at a life sciences company, they are not just scared, they're feeling the pressure of the opposite of open source in their business. They have data vendors coming to them saying, you must use everything we offer. You know, we don't need to name names, right? <laughs> right? And, and, and everybody's probably imagining names that's not the one I'm imagining, to tell you the truth. But the, the data aggregator, the data vendor that makes things is trying to drive an entire platform often to, to make those things happen. And, and it's, it's, it's every data vendor's prerogative in many ways to tie like an entire tail of platform. The problem is then, which is the reality of this other picture of data from 500 directions, I can't build my system. I have data coming from all directions and one vendor thinks they are everything for it. And I think that holds true also to some degree for Transmart. It has to be open as well to all these other things. It can't try and contain every data in the universe, but it can do a really good job of containing the parts and pieces of data where there's gaps in the system. And there's plenty of gaps in the system in terms of things that are standardized and places to put all of these data sets. There's another constraint that we also have to deal with, which is not everything can fit into a system. 
And what I mean by that is we've, we've come across this problem many times. We try and build technology. I love making software. And when we try and make software for one-off studies, we usually fail. <laughs> And the, the, the problem is a lot of these studies require all the custom work. You need a SAS programmer to sit down with the data, to pull it into their system, to rake up publication. They have to do that stuff. And we try and force often things into system models for study-specific functions. We have to be careful about that. Um, but there are foundational things. And if, if there are things we want to do, cross-study analysis, there are things we want to do to look across you know, the, the whole translational cycle from a, a clinical trial data set out to a EMR data set to see whether or not there's signal about an adverse event that's, that's playing out, um, then we need those foundational data sets. Right? But we just have to be careful not to build too high and convince ourselves that our studies are always systems. And, and we could spend a long time on that, but, but the upshot of it is um, it's not so bad to be minimalist with a lot of the things Transmart can do. It doesn't need to do every type of analytics. Very often the best answer is make sure the data is available, make sure it can do prep to research type analyses to prove you can find your information and that it's sufficient to answer your question and get that information into another tool which is more purpose built for your analysis. And so again, where does it fit in? It's pretty good in that space. In fact, it's as sort of a child of I2B2. Um, I2B2's real strength is actually not as an analytical tool. It's really a strength is in a prep to research tool. And I don't know if people have decided that's the way to go, um, but I think really focusing on that prep to research cycle where you're getting just enough analysis but not the final analysis out of the tool to make sure it's possible to do what you're doing um, is an important piece of, of, of making these things work. Oh, hope I'm not running too low on time. All right, I got 10 minutes left. I was going to do a demo. Um, real quick, why are things like, why is genomics like Twitter in the infrastructure we're doing here? I think we do have this issue of a lot of extended data types that are starting to really stress the systems that we're looking at. And Transmart does have some level of a play to hook in these extended data types to um, the capabilities. We're hearing about a lot of groups who either say, I want to bring in my images, I want to bring my social media data, I want to bring in my... Um, genomics, and they all seem to follow this basic pattern. And I think we have to be good in the Transmart world um, to stay somewhat close to the, the right-hand side of the diagram. The left-hand side of the diagram is, a, is an enterprise IT function. It's managing big data sets, building lots of disk, figuring out how to find them, but bringing information into these annotated forms, these NLP processed forms, these you know, already crunched data sets, is the way we can then put them into a set where it's the downstream result we can then do some analysis on to combine information to find new results. So in the end, what does this platform look like? If I was standing in front of like the group that's trying to do end-to-end -end evidence management in a life sciences company, I'd tell them, you need one of these, some rocket ship that looks like this. You know, you're going to end up wanting to have a whole network of external people working as collaborators, and you're going to have to do the following things from the bottom up. You'll have to do data curation aggregation, data transformation, data exchange with outside parties, have a catalog so you know where everything is, deliver things to users, have a library of everything you have as content with all your metadata and reference data, a way to view cohorts, a way to do analytics, a way to do custom stuff. And I think Transmart can do many of these pieces, but it's probably best on transforming data to a point which is ready for analytics not necessarily doing end-to-end -end capability, and building a good data asset catalog of the information that's available inside the company. So I, I know this slide is a bit of an eye chart, but I really just want to point one more thing out about what's happening out there in the world beyond our little universe. I'm not getting called in, actually, for a lot of Transmart projects, believe it or not. <laughs> We're getting called in for a lot of big data projects, and the issue is the systems that are in place for evidence management are breaking. And they're breaking because the systems they bought to support all of the content that they're licensing don't hold the content anymore. And the productivity level of the programmers that are working against that content is too low. So if it takes two days to run a SaaS program to figure out the cohort size inside of MarketScan, which is 14 million patients for 13 years, and they need it done in an hour, they need to swap everything out. And while they're swapping everything out, the basic question they're going to ask is, well, how am I going to deal with all this clinical trial and genomic data over on the side too? Because I see this as one continuous thing. And so there's going to be projects that are trying to bring together those two sides, and they're happening in the next five years. 
I don't know if they're all happening this year, but they're happening soon. My little dream of having that EMR data set in the same system as my uh, clinical trial data, um, that's not just my dream. That's like the CIO of most major pharma's dream. And so to get there, we're going to need something like this. And, and this is just our concept of how to put this together. There's a couple of key elements, maybe just to highlight where Transmart fits again. And one of the, the most important ones is, is this new thing over here. Where are we? This data lake, <laughs> right? And that's that groups are going to be putting in a lot of information that's untransformed. It's that raw content they need to put in there. And that should be and will always be, I think, something upstream of Transmart. It's a bunch of information that's not yet totally ready for analysis by design because the groups that are over on the other side have locked it up for too long. There's some biostats group that said nobody can touch any of the clinical trial data sets. Someone has to get out of their hands and get in that data lake. And so there's going to be these big initiatives to get things into those data lakes in the next couple of years, and that's going to cross over all the different groups, and that's going to be one big piece of infrastructure that we're going to have to tie back into if we're, we're trying to bring stuff out. But then we have to do all the hard stuff to get it out of that infrastructure into you know, whatever we're calling analytical marts, and that's where we fit in. We fit back in at the analytical marts. It's something we can actually use. We can put an application against it. We can reliably build on the data structures. We can reliably build against the ontologies. We can expect this kind of metadata to sit in this place. Um, and then we can build out the apps on the far side. And some of the first apps will be you know, the cohort viewers and things that do that prep to research function. Because as I said before, I think a lot of the work's going to be pretty um, study-based in a life sciences company when they're going to go out and have a big decision that's going to be binding against it for someone who's a regulatory body or someone who's going to pay you know, an extra $50 million through their formulary based upon how they present their drug. It's not going to be some little quick whizzy wig wiggle inside a Transmart. Um, so what I'm going to do is show you a quick picture of a, sort of our view that's based on this picture here of how to integrate, at least to some degree, these open standards of I2B2, Transmart, OMOP, SDTM. Because our, our picture sort of starts to look like we need transparency and portability of cohorts. So at least the cohort itself has to live outside of Transmart. It can live in Transmart, but it has to be pulled out of Transmart into other tools. Um, so I have a couple minutes to show that for you guys. Hopefully I'm not dead in terms of like the... Um, so here's a quick demo. And, and interestingly enough, one of the groups we're working with built out their data catalog in salesforce.com, which is kind of funny because we had Keith talking earlier, and I think he's right, that people who consume data are customers. <laughs> <laughs> right? And the reason why Salesforce.com got adopted in this particular co company is because they wanted to use a customer-friendly system to service data to their customers. Now, of course, it can't do much. All it really is is a catalog. So I can go into the catalog and say, well, what kind of data have I requested? Or I can say, you know, who do we have a partnership with? And it's a CRM system. It really is. I don't, I'm not going to go into it because it's not really the point of this talk. Um, but as someone's going through the CRM system, eventually they're going to get down to things it can't answer. And here the thing we can answer is we can see what studies, we can see what data has been running in the studies, we can see our data assets, and maybe we'll find a data asset that's one we're interested in. And I can see there's XYZ Health as an asset. I might want to build a cohort off of that. So I could punch out and say, well, what other cohorts have we made? <laughs> and what tools have we made cohorts off of this data asset? Um, and so here we've created some in I2B2, some using ClickView, and I'll, I'll, I'll create a new one just because I'm doing a demo. And it is important to be able to take these other tools, which have other kinds of user interfaces and functions and ways to go and get the cohorts. And I'll, I'll emphasize that one way to get this data in would be to run a SAS program. I'm just not going to demo it because I'm not a good SAS program nor would it be very interesting to watch me do it. But I can use I2B2, as long as it's participating with me. And because we don't have that much time, we're going to use the ever-exciting I2B2 query of finding male diabetics, <laughs> which is some legacy of the fact that people put diabetic patients into my EMR data. And endocrine. So what I'm going to do here, because I have to like bend over to 
get this all running and whatnot, is I'm going to run this query, and then I'm going to save it back in. I'm going to edit in a visual tool, and then I'm going to go um, after that, and I'm going to go and bring it back up in Transmart and be able to run you know, very quick analysis function on it. So I have my male diabetics. I can save it to this cohort library, which is kind of like the workspace in I2B2, but it goes beyond I2B2. It goes to whatever you want to use it for, because it's now saving all of those patients into a patient set that are universally available. If you have some other piece of data on those patients, and it's linked to the same de-identified set, you can get access to it. So now it's in my library. I have my male diabetics, and I can see, how do I want to look at this cohort? What do I want to do with it? Um, and I'll, because I have a a couple different viewers, and you saw there was a clinical trial viewer, an observational viewer, and a, um, another viewer that would, would run in Transmart. Um, here I'm just going to use the observational viewer, this is observational data. And it should come green in a sec. Right, it's prepping it. And there we go. View my observational data. So here we're just putting a, a front end that's a click view front end. But you could be putting in a Spotfire front end, or you could be putting in your own custom D3 front end. The point here is to be able to take a front end that's attaching to that cohort and be able to visualize it or run the analysis of your choice that you want to put on top of it in third-party tools. Um, and if we do happen to use those third-party tools, we can then do an operation on it. You know, these are more visual tools than you'll get out of the box with a lot of the free open source ones. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with any of the open source tools we're linking into Transmart. Um, it's just that a lot of the groups that we end up working with want to bring in these um, commercial products they've licensed for a very long time that they have a lot of expertise on to connect back to the cohorts they're going to generate in Transmart and other tools. And so here I can save this one. It'll be you know, diabetes with uh, Hispanic and white. Submit that. Now I'll finally go back in. And you'll note these are all created off of this data set, the original one, EMR XYZ Health. I mean, we have like 100 data sets in the system, so we could create different cohorts off of different data sets. And the whole objective here is to have that lineage back if we're using different tools as to exactly what operations we use to create this, this downstream asset we're going to use in another function. But finally, I'll go in. I'll go back to Transmart. And here I brought this <coughs> subset of 2,800 patients into Transmart through that integration point. And now I've used you know, basically two tools on the way to get into Transmart to the cohort selection, using Transmart mostly in this case as the system it's good at, which the other tools don't know anything about doing genomic analysis. They don't know how to attach the genomic data. They don't understand that kind of content. But now we're in Transmart. We do understand that content. But in the interest of time, I'll just do a quick um, simple little analysis in this panel. So what do I have? HbA1c. I'll try and look at the hemoglobin. That's nice, Emily. It's going great. <laughs> going great. Doing it now. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> and so finally, um, we're in Transmart and we're able to access that underlying EMR data. We built a little extension, applet, whatever you want to call it, that allows to look at it in this analysis panel um, over time because just looking at the histogram of EMR data isn't that exciting because we actually have to look at whether or not these patients progressed or didn't progress and things like that in terms of that data set. So we're all allowing ourselves a little bit extra freedom, which is a feature we want in Transmart as well to, to be able to do some additional analyses directly on that first panel. So. <laughs> she entertains me. <laughs> I thought I had turned off Link, so that's all my fault, not hers. Um, so anyways, I, I know I'm maybe a couple minutes over, um, but you know, I wanted to wrap up and give you a quick quick taste of sort of the project we're working on now. Oh, I ignore that. Um, and that's this, this project with CCFA, which is sort of the next initiative. It's, it's not that different to the work that MJ Fox is doing from a conceptual standpoint. Um, and it's, it's trying to take a lot of these same tools to take the content within the 
um, disease advocacy group, and, and I think the disease advocacy groups are a fantastic place to adopt Transmark because it fits right into that notion of how do we make this data available so multiple people don't have to curate, generate, and build the same data set over and over again that multiple life sciences companies need. So J&J &J has a program in IBD. So does Millennium, both good friends of ours, <laughs> right? And so CCFA is working to build out um, and already has a program for bringing in genomic data from already, I think, a pediatric population of 3,000 patients, and they're going to a bigger population of their, their broad base, which I think the total membership of CCFA is 200,000 people. But much like the, you know, the big projects with TRAIT and the big project with you know, the Million Veterans Project, they're collecting samples, genotyping samples, creating the data set, using an adapted version of Transmart to allow life sciences companies to collaborate. And in the next three to five years, we'll have um, hopefully another good reference that we can look at to show how these kinds of things work. Um, the one twist I'd say that's interesting that's coming out of CCFA, and it's probably going to come out of these disease advocacy groups even more, um, is they're very involved in the patient engagement piece. And so unlike a life sciences company with a clinical trial, um, and, and maybe a little bit unlike an EMR where they're just collecting data, the purpose of the whole system is to engage the patients in their care, to educate the patients, and to collect new information about the patients. And so there's a serum system of sorts. You can call it a study management system, but, it, but it's, it's a blend between a, a study management system, a serum system, and a social network that gets put into place for a solution like a disease advocacy group that starts bringing some of those interesting sources back in that, that I think will, will hopefully shed light on some of the, the missing information that life sciences companies need at the tail end of that um, evidence life cycle to generate things like, this is when things really work with this drug. These are when we're seeing outcomes, and these are the factors in patients that we don't capture clinically because a medical record is not the full picture in terms of the outcome. It's the physician's documentation. And if you want the, the picture of the outcome from the patient's perspective, we can get it through a system like this. So I hope there's been some interesting pieces here. Um, thanks, everyone. And I continue to be so excited that everyone exists and is here. It's a dream come true for me that, that Transmart's gotten this far. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. Um, I think we're a little over, so I'm going to ask the next speakers to come down, and we'll, we'll get you set up. Um, I do want to say that, I mean, for me, being new to the, to the foundation and seeing what everyone's talking about in terms, of, especially of the next generation, we're, we're talking uh, this time for real about a next generation of Transmart. This is the first question, is, is what Transmart is and should be and what it should not be. Um, and I think that's what we have to think about even before we talk about architecture. It's very important to, to build a few things well in a year than to build a lot of things sort of in, in halfway fashion uh, in two years. So, so thanks, Dan. So, Dan, is it ever going to shift? Is that going to be something nice where people can use it? Um, I think their plan is the short term is they have to work with the funder. Yeah. So you don't have to ask them, because I, I really shouldn't speak for CCFA. But the, there's a couple pieces to it. One, part of that money is coming from the Helmsley Trust, so there's some some public interest to the, the final output of the data. But they also have a sustainability challenge. Yeah, we'll do so they have to figure out how are they going to continuously fund the, the future research. So, so it's going to stay. Yeah.